Thanks everybody for showing up today. My name is Scott Douglas. I am the director here at the Hahn Horticulture Garden at Virginia Tech. Um, but today we're going to be hitting the road and flying down to Austin, Texas. So it's fun to be able to travel without actually having to travel. So before we get started, a couple of Zoom related things. We will ask that you um, make sure you turn off your video and your camera and your microphone. Turning off the video helps some people who may have less than um, stable internet connection. So it allow those people to stream a little better. Uh, we'll use the chat box for questions. So if you have questions, um, you can type those in the chat and I'll ask those at the end of the presentation. So today's presenter is Tanya Zastro. She's the director of programs at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. Um, I will let her do a more detailed introduction of herself and the garden. So with that, I'll hand over the virtual mic. Thank you for doing this today. You're welcome. Thank you, Scott. Uh, yeah, my name is Tanya Zastro. I'm with the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center here in Austin, Texas. Um, how many of you have been here before? Anyone visited the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center here? If you feel free to put in the chat if you visited here. If not, you can definitely come visit. I've been here for about six years. Before I um, came to the Wildflower Center, I was out in your neck of the woods. I was at the US National Arboretum in um, Washington, DC. So that's where I was before I um, came out here to the great state of Texas. And then before that, I worked at a small nature center in Wisconsin. Um, that didn't even have running water. So um, I've kind of worked all over the place and uh, found myself now here at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center here in Austin, Texas. So it's a wonderful place to work and um, I'm happy to explain and talk to you about this great um, garden here in Texas. So we'll go ahead and get started. Now our mission here at the Wildflower Center is to inspire the conservation of native plants. So we are an all native plant garden um, to Texas. So they're Texas native plants. I, yeah, Marjorie said she drove by on the way to somewhere. Uh, yeah, Texas uh, is a great place. It's a huge place. So you could have been uh, uh, somewhere on your way to Texas. Um, and the Wildflower Center was established in the 80s, it was established in uh, 85, and we were at a current location in 1995. So this place behind me here was built in 1995. And like I said, our mission is to, uh, to inspire the conservation of native plants. The native plants to um, Texas are the ones that we feature here in our garden. Now we do that through um, the research that we conduct here on site, um, but we are associated with the University of Texas at Austin. So we are a university garden, just like you all are. Um, and so we conduct research here on site, but we also host research um, conducted by our uh, researchers through the University of Texas, but we also host many researchers from other universities. So we have researchers researchers from Texas State, um, from Texas Tech, and believe it or not, we even host reachers from Texas A&M. So we actually have a study going on right now with reachers, researchers from UT and Texas A&M working together. So we have a lot of research going on on site here at our facility. Um, and we do that through, um, we also have display gardens and, and arboretum here on site. So we have 284 acres here um, at the Wildflower Center. And we also host experiences. And what I mean by experiences, it's a big word, right? So under that category, we have education, we have events, we have volunteering. And so we do that, all that falls under your experiences. And then Native Plants for All, we want our garden to be for everybody. So we want everybody to feel welcome and invited and um, we want everyone to enjoy our garden. Now, can anyone tell me who these two women are in this photo? These are our founders. And believe it or not, we were founded by two people. Can you tell me who these two women are? Feel free to put in the chat. One of them is probably easier than the other. One of them is our namesake. 
obviously Lady Bird Johnson, right? Former First Lady of the United States. And Mrs. Johnson is a Texan, um, born here in the great state of Texas. And she, the reason we're part of the University of Texas um, is because she graduated from the University of Texas. And correct, Sandra got it right. Awesome, Helen Hayes, exactly. That's actress Helen Hayes. And so Mrs. Johnson, when she formed the Wildflower Center, she wanted someone with great name recognition to join her in the founding of the Wildflower Center. Um, and so she had her friend, um, Helen Hayes, help her um, form the Wildflower Center. So we are formed by these two um, great um, women, and these are the two founders of the Wildflower Center. And Mrs. Johnson, she has a saying, right plant, right place, right? She wanted Texas to look like Texas, Virginia to look like Virginia. And so that's why we are a native plant garden. She didn't want the whole U.S. to look like um, every place else. She wanted us just everyone, every state to look like it should. And so that's why um, we focus on native plants. And um, about um, 2007, and later in her life, is when she wanted us to become part of the University of Texas, her alma mater. And so we are currently part of the School of Architecture. We are a self-supporting unit of the University of Texas, um, but we are an affiliated, um, we are part of the university. Um, we have an advisory council. Um, and we are an organized research unit of the university. However, we are not on campus like your garden. We are a little bit far away, a little bit, we're still in Austin, but we are located in Southwest Austin. So we're about 13 miles out um, in the Southeast side, or Southwest, Southwest side of the city. So you can see where the Longhorn is there in the upper corner of your map. And we are on the bottom left-hand corner. That's where we are. So we are not on campus, but we are part of campus. And that's um, where we are. So um, can make it a little challenging for students to get to us. Um, but we are free for all staff, faculty, and students to come. And we do get staff, students doing internships with us. And students come take a break with us. Uh, many faculty and staff come and visit us. Um, and do, like I said, they do their research with us. Um, currently we have an exercise program going on um, on site with us because it's safer and easier to exercise outside right now due to COVID. So there's many things that happen um, at the Wildflower Center that are part of the university. Now at a glance, uh, we are 284 acres and we are proud, I'm proud to say, we are the State Botanic Garden of Texas. So, like many things, you have a state, you have a state tree, you have a state flower, you have a state dish, you have a state, um, you have a state, uh, uh, whatever, you have all these state things, right? Does Virginia have a state garden? Do you know? I don't know if you do. If you don't know, maybe you could become one. Um, so we are the official state garden and arboretum of Texas. And that happened in 2000, uh, I believe 16 or 17, we became the official state botanic garden and arboretum of Texas. Um, we have 800 native Texas plant species here on site. We have 12,000 members nationwide. Um, we have about 250 active volunteers that contribute about 50 hours a year. Um, and that, that's about over 30,000 um, hours annually. We have over 200,000 guests annually, and we have the largest online database of native plants in North America that many of you might actually use on a daily basis or on a regular basis. And that photo there of a cedar waxwing, um, that's one of our volunteers. He takes our photos for us. In fact, pretty much almost all the photos in this slideshow are taken from a lot of our volunteers. Now here's a map of the grounds to give you an idea of our site and our location. We have our central complex. Um, that's where a lot of our gardens are located. We have our courtyard where our great hall is located with our restrooms and our store. Um, and then our 
it's, when you come visit the Wildflower Center, you can see behind me, there's the sandstone. Mrs. Johnson really wanted our buildings, our grounds, our gardens to reflect Texas because right plant, right place. She wanted the whole facility to reflect that as well. So when you visit, um, the center really reflects that as well. So when you visit, you see the buildings reflect the Spanish heritage of Texas, and then the white limestone buildings reflect the German heritage of Texas, and then there's metal structures, uh, metal corrugated buildings that reflect the ranching heritage of Texas. So when you come here, you really get a feeling for Texas. Um, it's a wonderful display of Texas, whether it's the architecture um, or the plants. Um, and so when you're visiting here, you can see the central complex that has our, um, you can see number 13 on the map, that's our theme gardens, where it has a variety of theme displays. Every single bed there has a different display of gardens. And I'll go through some photos here of the gardens in just a second. Um, number 14 is our homeowner displays. So if you're thinking about how to use theme, uh, native plants in your garden, that's a great place to go visit and get some ideas. Now, new in 2014, we added on a family garden, and that's um, the Lucy and Ian family garden. Now, who is Lucy? Can you guys, who are Lucy and Ian? Those names sound familiar to you? Anyone know? You can put in the chat if you know. Those names sound familiar to you? Lucy and Linda? Daughter of LBJ, exactly. Yes, Lucy and Linda are the two daughters. Yes, Lucy is the daughter and Ian is her husband. Uh, Lucy lives here in Austin and Linda lives, you guys know? Virginia. Virginia, exactly. And Linda, yep, Linda lives in Virginia. Uh, so Lucy lives here in Austin and Lucy was one of the big donors for the family garden, thus the Nick garden is named after Lucy. Um, and so uh, the family garden was open in 2014 and um, it was a great huge, I'll go more into that in a little bit here. And then in 2012, we opened up our Texas Arboretum and I'll go more into that in a little bit here as well. Oops. Oops, excuse me. Now, Texas is huge, right? Huge state, so many different areas in Texas. We have, um, there's like 12 eco regions here in Texas, so many different areas. So we can't possibly display all the different plants in Texas because there's so many different eco regions, so many different types of plants. And we're just one little area here in Texas. So we can't possibly display all the different types of plants. We just don't have the conditions for it. Uh, but this gives you an idea of the different types of areas in Texas. Um, and uh, all the different types of um, conditions that are available in Texas, uh, the variety. Uh, Virginia, definitely a smaller state, um, uh, but so many varieties here in Texas. Um, great area to travel through if you haven't to see the different varieties, the huge pines on the East Coast, and then you go to the, the West Coast, you see the, um, the, the, the mountains and the desert, and it's just a wonderful place to travel. Um, but we try our best to display many of the plants that are in Texas, focusing um, quite a bit on the central area of Texas. Now, we have nine acres of cultivated gardens um, here in our gardens um, that we have on display. Uh, we feature many streams and ponds. Uh, we have a pollinator garden and an insectary where we bring in um, many of the caterpillars that we find. Um, we have natural and formal gardens. Gardens. We have regional collections that we feature, and then we have those theme gardens that I mentioned. And then we have the homeowner garden and landscape garden um, demonstrations that I talked about before as well. And I'll just show some photos of some of our gardens as we go through. So here's some of our ponds. Um, this is the pond and the pollinator garden. Um, in this area as well, in our pollinator garden, we feature shelter for our pollinators um, and we feature habitat for our pollinators, whether it's the larval form or the adult form of our pollinators. We have seeps for our butterflies so they can get water. Um, we also feature um, 
shelter and uh, larval food form for our pollinators. So there's different plants um, for our pollinators, whether it's nectar uh, for the adults or uh, plants for caterpillars to eat a uh, variety of food in this pollinator garden. Um, in this pond right here, we have a lot of frogs and turtles and uh, garter snakes and a, a nice variety of um, wildlife that like to inhabit this pond. Um, it's a great place to sit and just watch the wildlife that um, like to hang around um, this pond right here. Uh, here's the insectary with a lot of blue bonnets in bloom here. Um, so our volunteers will go around the garden, collect the um, caterpillars they see and rear them in the insectary and then release them uh, when they, they turn into butterflies or moss um, so they don't get parasitized. Um, and then uh, so they can hopefully uh, turn into butterflies or moss without getting eaten as well. Um, and it's a great, uh, great thing to use for educational programs as well. Uh, we have a lot of fall interest in our garden as well. Um, we are the wildflower center. So a lot of times people think only come during the spring. That's not true. We have a lot of fall interest. Our muleys are beautiful in the fall, the colors that they turn. Um, so there's a lot of uh, beautiful things to see here in the fall as well. This is our theme garden. You can see these square themes, uh, square gardens. Um, and every theme has a different theme to it. Every garden has a different theme to it. So you can see we use stock tanks um, for our, our garden beds, um, very Texas style. Uh, and this one is our container gardens here. Um, and this is a lot of fun. Kids love going up to the stock tanks here. And at the Wildfire Center, we're also very much about sustainability. So the mulch that's down below here is recycled glass that was um, collected at an Austin recycling plant. It's tumbled and um, collected at a, re at a re um, recycling plant. Um, we also use a lot of pecan mulch in our garden. Um, that's probably the number one mulch that we use around in our garden. Now we also have a, we don't do a traditional vegetable garden here because um, we're all native plant garden, but we do have native plants that are edible. So we have a taste of place garden. And these are many of the uh, edible plants that are edible, edible plants that are edible, edible plants that are native um, that we feature. Uh, the salad you see there is a salad our cafe sold and the hot pink, dressing you see on there is a prickly pear dressing that they made from the tuna, from the fruits of the prickly pear that they um, process, that they made. Um, and then you can see there's the prickly pear jam uh, on the upper left. Um, there's the double claw fruit and the bright red tiny seeds or chili piquin. Uh, don't be deceived, those tiny little things pack a punch. So we make some salsa with that. Um, and then the Texas persimmon, they made a nice kind of a dessert out of that as well. Um, so we around our cafe, we have a um, garden filled with all of these edible plants that you can eat um, that are all native plants. Now here's a question. Here's a little preschool kid from a local school and she has a piece of wood in the chat. What do you think she's, what is she doing? What do you think? You could just in the chat, let me know what you think she's doing. No wrong answers here, just in the chat. What do you think she's doing with that piece of wood? Any idea? Building a birdhouse, that's a good one, okay. Any other ideas? She was on, she was from a preschool and she was on a field trip and she was in our family garden and this is our nature build area. And they were just playing with our loose parts play, our, um, it's an area filled with what we call tree cookies. What's in our hand is what we call a tree cookie and logs and pieces of bamboo and rocks and all just kind of loose parts, right? And she had that piece of wood in her hand. And I said to her, what are you building? 
And she looked at me and she goes, an H-E-B, duh. And if you're not from Texas, you might not know what an H-E-B is, but an H-E-B is a grocery store. It's, it's a very well-known grocery store here. It's kind of like if, if, if she were to say this in Virginia, she might've said a Wegmans or a Safeway. Um, and so she, she looked at me like, oh, an H-E-B, like, duh, like, of course I'm building an H-E-B. So a child in a loose parts play area, nature build play, imagination is endless, right? It could be anything. She was just building and she was having fun and she was creating in her world, a grocery store, a place she goes to probably on a weekly basis with her family out of that piece of wood was an HEB. So when, I, when we built that Lucy and Ian family garden in 2014, we did it because um, we wanted children to connect with nature. Now, you, you may know the story of um, Lady Bird Johnson when her mother passed away pretty early in her life. Um, so she's often quoted as saying nature raised her. Um, you know, she grew up with her dad and her aunt, um, and she spent a lot of time outdoors. So she was connected with nature pretty strongly because she was out on Catet Lake and just spent a lot of time outdoors. And so she had a very strong connection to nature. And so um, it was one of the reasons why the Johnson family really wanted us to have a family garden here. In fact, when we were talking about calling it a children's garden, Lucy said, no, let's call it a family garden because families connect to, to nature together. Um, and so we we call it a family garden and we also call it a garden of yes, because we want kids to run on the lawn. We want kids to touch the plants. We want kids, if you can see that kid, he's climbing that inverted tree stump. We want kids to touch the rocks. We want kids to touch the water. We want kids to have fun. We want kids to play and interact with the plants. We don't want kids to come into the garden and say, don't go there. Don't touch that. Don't run over there. Don't do that. We want them to say, yes, we want them to play. We want them to explore. We want them to have fun. We want them to, you know, experience the garden and to connect with nature. So this is our family garden. Um, a place just like Mrs. Johnson connected with nature. We want families to do that here at the Wildflower Center. And it's working. Our demographics and our visitation to the garden have drastically changed. Our, you see now families coming in younger, so much younger. Um, it's, it's amazing. Our story time last week, we had 37 children come to story time. And this, this is times of COVID, right? So we can't handle 37 kids all at once. We had to do multiple story times, smaller groups, and just keep repeating story times so we could handle everyone. Um, so the, the family garden has been a huge success where we can have children interact safely in nature and just have a wonderful time and enjoy with all these different spaces we've been able to provide for them. Now in our Arboretum, we have a 16 acre um, Texas Arboretum where we feature oaks. Do you know how many oak trees, different oak species we have in Texas? Any guesses? We have a lot. We have like, I think it's 53 different types of oak trees in Texas. We have a lot, we have a lot. Um, so we have an oak collection here that we feature in our Arboretum. We have a Hall of Texas Heroes. So if you walk around our Hall of Texas Heroes, you can read about all these different stories revolving around live oak trees because there's um, all these great stories that happen around oak trees, um, all these historic trees. So there's, um, there's a, a tree on the A&M campus where if you walk underneath this tree and you're in love with someone, the story is you'll be together forever. Now, if you go underneath the branch of this tree and you're feeling lonely, the story is you're going to be alone forever. Um, there's, um, we have the prodigy of the LBJ tree, the Texas White House, the cabinet oak. And so the tree, the story of that tree is um, when LBJ would gather people people at the Texas White House, he would have everyone gather outside at that tree and he would dress comfortably 
but he would have everyone, you know, they're coming to meet the president. So they would be dressed very formally and he would have everyone gather and meet outside. Um, and he would have them all, um, he wouldn't let them inside into the air conditioning or was more comfortable until they came to a consensus that he wanted, right? And so um, that's called the cabinet oak. Well, we have, we collected acorns from all these famous trees and we um, grew those acorns out into um, oak trees and we have planted them into what we call the Hall of Texas Heroes. So there's all these stories of these famous Texas trees planted in this circle, uh, what we call the Hall of Texas Heroes. The Cathedral of um, Oaks, um, with this, what we call the cathedral swings. You can see this kid's having a blast on that. Um, and then we have a wonderful place called the Fort Build where you can build all of these great things um, in the Fort Build. So also in the Texas Arboretum, you can learn about oak wilt, you can learn about West Texas trees, um, and you can learn about how to plant trees under your, um, uh, how, you know, under, um, electrical wires and things like that. So it's a great place. Now here at the our, um, Wildflower Center, people come here right now. This is busy time. This is go time. We are getting people coming like crazy because the blue bonnets are in bloom. It's wildflower season. It is super busy. Um, but the fall, people weren't coming because we didn't have wildflowers in bloom. So we wanted to change things up and say, hey, people, there's lots of things to do here at the Wildflower Center in the fall. So we created an exhibit called Fortlandia. Did you, have you all built forts when you were children? Did you all build forts? Right, I did. I grew up in Wisconsin, so I built forts out of um, snow. That's what I built forts out of. Um, yes, Scott says, yes, yes, definitely. Um, and Jean in the Arboretum, not all Texas oak species are represented, but they're trying, they're definitely trying. Um, some of them are hard to collect and some of them are hard to get to grow here. Um, our soil in the Arboretum is uh, rock. It's really, really rough. And so not all the oak species will grow here, um, but they're trying to collect as many and get them growing here as much as possible. Um, so what we did is we created an, an exhibit called Fortlandia and it's a hands-on fort exhibit um, meant to inspire kids to play to, um, and also inspire adults remember those times when you built forts when you were connected to outside and you had a great time um, building forts and uh, so Fortlandia is a, is a time when we call for designers to build a fort that highlights our Texas landscape in the Arboretum and uh, designers submit their designs we have a panel of judges and we select the top 10 designs and we put them out there in the Arboretum and they're on display for about four months. This one that you see right here is called Thalweg and it was, it represented the um, lowest point in a river. Now this one right here, Grand Oak Mission, Bird of Sawmill, it represents the Alamo, kind of has the design of the Alamo. So just give you an idea of some of the forts that we had on display here over the past. We've had this exhibit now for uh, four years, I believe. Um, and this one represents hide and seek. And so that's what the, the inspiration behind this fort was. Um, this one was Fort Blocks. This represented the toy that you played with, where you put like the circle um, through the circle hole and the square through the square hole. That's what this fort was. Um, Fortlandia has been so popular that uh, the Trail Foundation, which manages Ladybird Trail, it's a 10 mile trail around uh, the Ladybird Lake in downtown Austin, they want to be a part of it. So they are participating with us next year. Um, and there's going to be a fort on that trail. And that trail sees millions of people a year. Um, so we're really excited to have a fort on their trail. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. Our visitation increased, I think, 85% in the fall, thanks to Fortlandia, because people want to be out. They want to play in the forts. Um, and it's been a great opportunity. Now our natural areas, which the Arboretum is part of, I have over two miles of trails in our um, natural hill country landscape. Um, it's a junior, jun juniper oak woodland um, and it features oak savannas. Now there's some other cool stuff that's going on here. Remember I said we have uh, research going on? This is our research. This is over a 20 year program 
you can see all these different colors going on. They represent whether the, it's a control plot, a burn plot, a mow plot, um, and whether it's burned in the summer or mowed in the summer or burned in the um, summer. So it's a research study to determine what is the best way to manage your land. Is it to burn it, mow it, and when is it to do that? Is it the summer, the fall, or the winter? Um, Texas is something like 96% private land. So in order to do any type of conservation work or management work, you need to work with private landowners to do that. And so we have had this study going on for a very long time. Um, and this is trying to figure out what is the best way to manage our lands, to promote wildflowers, to promote native species, to um, to manage uh, invasive species. And this is the study we've been doing to um, watch that. Now, this is our prescribed fire program we have going on. And you can see here um, the prescribed fire um, from the drone and how it works. And I'll just let this go. You can see them working. Um, and how it works through the plot. You can see our trails are used as the, um, the burn block so it doesn't jump over. We have a re UT researcher that is now evaluating our data and submitting papers um, on this data we've been collecting for quite a few years. In fact, our, we have staff right out there right now doing, um, uh, doing studies to see what, um, they're doing vegetation surveys right now to see what plants are coming up in the, in the plots. The shapes of the plots are, not, um, I don't think they're meaningful. No, I think they're, um, a lot of them are determined by the trails systems. And you can see how when they do the prescribed burn, they do it in a way, um, they start it depending upon which way the winds are going and the fire is now going to put itself out. Because they started on one end and then they go to the other end and then it, it comes in and it will, um, you can see it's gonna come in and, and uh, put itself out there. And you can see how they burned around that big um, oak tree there so they don't um, kill, the, kill the big oak trees in the middle. So fire is an important part of our landscape here in Texas. And we, we need to make sure that we use fire um, wisely so that we don't have fires that uh, burn out of control. We had a huge fire in 2011 that burned quite a bit of land. Um, it's the largest fire in Texas history. I think it was, all right, there we go. Um, one, another research program that's happened here, we have a habitat. it's a grass we have developed here at the Wildflower Center. It's a mix of buffalo grass, blue grandma, and curly mesquite. And in fact, this is where we are connected. Um, the Wildflower Center, um, um, came up with this grass and is now in uh, turf grass trials. And there's a researcher at Virginia Tech that is actually um, trying out this grass for us. So this is where our universities are working together. So that's a pretty cool connection there. Um, but is it a drought retolerant uh, resistant grass? And it is all native turf grass um, system that this have a turf is. Um, so it's a pretty cool turf grass and hopefully um, the trial will go well and we'll be able to you know release it widely we will see um let's see we also have a nursery like many many public gardens do uh, where we do public plant sales and you know we grow plants for our own gardens um, there's a switchgrass program going on through a ut researcher um, and we do conservation as well um, we also grow plants for ut as well we will grow plants for campus Seed banking, we, have a, we also have a seed banking uh, program and we also have an herbarium on site as well. 
Um, other things, this is personally my program that I'm in charge of. Um, I'm director of programs, so all the education that we have is under um, my department. So we do our school field trips, we have youth and family programs, we have camps, hopefully, we're trying, uh, trying to do them this year. Um, we do scout programs, birthday parties, uh, discovery packs, all those good things um, we do as well, trying to inspire those future leaders and, and you know, create those new stewards of the environment, just like Mrs. Johnson um, did uh, for us. Uh, classes and workshops too. Well, we do that for adults and professionals as well. We have a native plant gardening series that's popular in Salzburg spring and fall. Um, we have classes in plant science, we have classes in wellness, we have classes in art. Um, then we do professional development for teachers, for landscape designers, architects, um, uh, for all types of professionals. Now this is a new program that we were, have been involved in in the last few years. It's called Ole Texas, Outdoor Learning Environments Texas. Um, now what this program is about is we're trying to improve the health and development of early childhood. And we're doing this through the design of the outsides of early child care centers. And so we are working with the Department of State Health and Human Services um, to, through the design of your child care environments, um, by removing or improving, putting more natural elements in your child care centers, um, putting more, more plants, more, um, natural elements, more loose parts play, more gardens, more mud play, uh, more of these elements into your child care centers, uh, because research has shown that kids have more imaginative play, they get along better, they have, um, they develop um, their senses um, better, they have better eyesight, they have better social um, development when there is more interaction and time spent outdoors. And so um, we are involved with Ole Texas. Um, and that purple handprint that's there, that is a sign for a child-friendly plant. So we worked with the Texas Nursery and Landscape Association to um, identify child-friendly plants. And what that means is it's a plant that has some type of sensory elements. Um, it's non-toxic. Um, so we have that sign on our plants here at our plant sale. So when a parent is shopping and they see that sign on a plant, they know that it's, it's safe for them. Um, when they're shopping at their plants at our plant sale, they could put that in their yard. Also, if you go to the Best of Texas uh, website for TNLA, they know they can um, shop for that and find um, plants that are safe for a child environment. So school, if they're looking for plants to put in their schoolyard, they can find and select plants that are child friendly. Um, so uh, this is something new, new, newish for us that we're involved in and it's a statewide program. Um, and it's a, a lot of fun and um, hopefully will benefit a lot of children as we move further and more in this program. Uh, this is Nipona, the native plants of uh, North America. If you haven't, um, been and use this on our website, just go to wildflower.org and go to native plants and you can search for plants. It's not just Texas, so we have North America. Uh, so it's native plants for all of North America and you can find plants for your area. Um, and so you just enter a plant name there, common name or a scientific name and you'll be able to find it. And you can search on your area, you can search on your zone, you can search on your preference and it's all sorts of things will pop up. See right here, Turks cap it gives you the USDA symbol, the range, all sorts of great information. So if you haven't used our plant database, I highly suggest you do. It's a great resource. Um, it's a wonderful resource and a lot of people use it on a regular basis. Now, this is a famous quote by Mrs. Johnson. She did a lot of work with the national parks. Um, you know, she, this is, a, um, she often said the environment is where we all meet and the public garden is where a lot of people meet. And so that's very true for the wildflower center. Um, we bring a lot of people to the garden and that starts with our volunteers. Like I said before, we have volunteers that contribute over 30,000 hours a year and we could not do what we do without them. From our horticulture to the store, to our docents, education, uh, conservation, membership community, they're everywhere. Our volunteers are the life and blood of our place. Um, and we, we value everything 
that they do for us. So they're a great uh, service to what we do. Um, and uh, our events, we do a lot of events here at the Wildflower Center. Tuesday Twilights is a program going on right now where you can come out and enjoy some food, uh, some music. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful evening program. We normally don't allow dogs at the garden. It's like the one place in Austin where you can't take your dog. You can take your dog pretty much everywhere in Austin except the Wildflower Center. Uh, so dog days are the one time you can bring your dog to the garden. Um, Ladybird Day is the day we celebrate our found our founder. Um, it's a great time to come celebrate Mrs. Johnson and the work that she's done. Austin Museum Day is the day that all the museums in Austin are free, so that's a great day. Nature Nights is in June, and we celebrate everything nature, and we're free that day. Um, and then Winter Tree Fest is a day that we celebrate our Texas tree. So these are some of the events that we do um, here at the Wildflower Center. Uh, Illuminations is our evening. Uh, winter light event um, and it's a great way to come out and celebrate the lights um, in the winter. Um, it's a beautiful way to see the gardens at night. And then uh, of course I have to end with a longhorn because we are the University of Texas at Austin. You won't see a longhorn in the gardens very often but uh, you know I I, we are the University of Texas at Austin, and this is the Wildflower Center. And if you haven't come to visit us, I hope you do um, at some point. And uh, yeah, Clay, you asked how do they avoid burning the trees? So what they will do is they will mow a, um, a border around the trees. So if there's no fuel around the trees, so if they mow really low around the trees, that will stop the fire from going around the trees. Um, so that's often what they will do. They will make some kind of fire break around the trees um, or they will, um, that's generally what they do, or they will start the fire at the tree and that will burn it out. Um, so if the fire is going out from away from the tree, that will stop the fire from going in. Um, so those are some of the techniques that they do from stopping the fire um, from burning the tree. Um, Yes, Molly, it can be very hot when in Texas. It can, yeah, maybe uh, if you don't like heat, don't come in August or September. Um, we do irrigate or water. Uh, we, when the Wildflower Center was built in um, 1995, we had the largest rainwater um, collection system in the U.S. Um, when it was built, and we were very proud of that. Thankfully, that has been surpassed. Um, and uh, so we have a lot of cisterns on property. Um, and so we have three water sources on property. We have a ton of cisterns. We have a well system on site and then we have potable water as well. Um, so we will use those three systems um, to irrigate. Obviously we're a native plant garden. So we try not to um, water unless we need to but we're also a public garden. So um, if people come and they see a lot of dead plants, they're not a lot you know, happy about that as well. So we try to do um, a, a mix of both. Um, but our director of horticulture, one of her favorite sayings that she says um, that I'd like to say is she says, brown is a color too. So if you come and visit at certain times of the year, um, she'll say, well, brown is a color too, because at certain times of the year, it's more brown than other times of the year. And um, I will say, well, brown is a color too. So, um, you know, we will leave plants, uh, dead plants up because there's a purpose for dead plants at certain times of the year, they provide a lot of wildlife habitat. And so at other gardens might take them down because they look weedy or um, unpleasant. It's, you know, depending upon where, where you are, but we might leave them because they provide a, uh, a home or a purpose for wildlife. Um, so it, you know, it all depends. Um, Susan asks, are there particular insect or animal pests that cause damage to the garden? Yes, armadillos. We had a um, baby armadillos just run wild this spring. Cute as can be, super cute. If you ever see baby armadillos, so cute, so cute. But man, did they, <laughs> they were just leaving holes everywhere. Um, so cute, but man, did they leave a lot of holes and, um, and rabbits. Um, rabbits leave a lot of damage in the garden. Um, 
uh, we have rattlesnakes. Um, they don't cause damage, but they cause hazards for guests. So we have to watch out for those. Um, uh, what else do we have? Sometimes we have wild boars and that, that will come in the garden. Um, uh, but the armadillos and the rabbits have been the biggest pests lately. Um, all right, I think I caught all the, did I miss any questions, Scott? There was one earlier about, do you have all the Texas oak trees? We, we don't. Like, yeah, we don't. Um, we're trying, um, but our arboretum, um, it's, we're on a karst um, topography here in central Texas. The hill country is, is um, has a lot of karst rock. And so our arboretum especially is a lot of karst rock. So um, it is really difficult to get trees to grow <laughs> in the arboretum. So um, it can be really challenging to, so we don't, um, but we're trying for sure. The lacy oak is one that they're trying to collect and um, that's been a challenging one. Um, what do we do to manage the armadillos and rabbits? Um, you know, they haven't done any, uh, I don't think, I don't think they've done anything actually. Um, maybe they've used um, a natural type of repellent for the rabbits, but I don't think they did anything for the armadillos. Um, Oh, we have fire ants too. We have a lot of um, fire ants in the garden. And so we will use a natural orange oil to pour on the fire ant mounds uh, because they pop up in our, in our lawn. And that's not so fun for guests if they step on a fire ant mound. Um, so we, we will use those. Um, the garden uh, was not damaged by the floods. Um, we have in our, to our family garden, there's a dry creek. And um, when it rains, it'll fill up with water and then go down. Central Texas is known as the flash flood capital of the world. It really will fill up and then it's amazing how um, it can flood here really quickly. And so, um, you know, we've, we've had some damage from that when it, it rains really hard, but, um, We've had like some damage like to buildings and stuff um, from Hurricane Harvey and stuff. We've had some damage to some of our um, structures, things like that um, from the storms. If you, you probably heard the Texas snowstorm that hit, um, we had some damage to some of our bathrooms, um, pipes frozen, that kind of thing, um, some plant damage. Um, there's a Mexican olive that's behind me and right there that we're not quite so sure, you know, so there's a lot of plants that were waiting and see if they made it um, from that last storm. Um, it's really interesting. Ticks, we don't have as many ticks here having lived on the East Coast. Um, ticks are not as big of an issue, but we have chiggers. Chiggers are horrible here. So you know, don't have ticks, but we have chiggers. So, uh, yeah, we, uh, we normally don't get, you know, maybe you get frost or freeze maybe like once or so in the winter, but it's not so bad. Um, so Jean, yeah, normally we don't get, maybe I'll get like frost once maybe in a winter. Um, but this freeze that we had, in February, I have never been through a storm like that before in my life. Um, I'm from the North, so been through lots of snowstorms before, um, but I've never been through a snowstorm in a state that's not prepared for it. I've never been through a snowstorm where um, you don't have an electrical, you know, where it's just, you don't know when your power is gonna be turned back on. You don't have water. Um, so it was, you know, it's really interesting you, where you don't know if you can get to work to check on your plants, you know, you don't know if your, if your seed lab is like, did the power go off? 
you know, if your seed, if your seed lab, like your seed cooler, is it, is it on or not? You know, so it's, um, it was an interesting situation. Um, definitely. Thankfully, I was not one that had the flooding of pipes and things like that. And thankfully, most of our staff were okay. Um, and thankfully, at the center, we had some damage, but not too bad. Um, yeah, hopefully, um, Gene asks, undesirable insects be reduced by the big storm. I'm hoping the chiggers will be reduced. I haven't had chiggers yet, so hopefully. Um, but chiggers can be pretty, pretty awful here. Um, yeah, they definitely can be pretty awful. I haven't heard anybody complaining of them yet, so we'll see. But any other questions? If you, um, is the Virginia Tech Garden a member of AHS? Yes, we are. Okay, so if you're a member of um, the Virginia Tech Garden, you just have to show your membership card to us, and then you can use the Virginia Tech membership um, to get in free at the Wildflower Center. Um, if you come to Austin, hey, Texas is 100% open right now. So yeah, if you come to Austin right now, um, uh, yes, everything is open in Texas. Um, the only difference in Austin compared to the rest of Texas is um, in Austin, they're requiring you wear a mask, um, where the rest of Texas, you pretty much don't have to wear a mask anywhere. Um, but in Austin, at the, at the Wildflower Center, you do have to wear a mask. Um, and most of Austin, you still have to wear a mask. But in the rest of Texas, it's, it, it depends on the business and stuff, but things are open. It's very different than most of the rest of the state. Um, yeah, we're open. Um, there's no carding for vaccination cards, no. No, <laughs> no, uh, we're open, we're all outside. We don't have an indoor greenhouse or anything like that. Uh, we're all outside. Um, you know, we're, it's beautiful weather right now. The gardens look great. Um, yeah, it's there's lots to see and do here in Austin. Austin's a great city. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a great place. Texas has a lot to see and do. Texas has a lot of beautiful natural areas. So if you if you haven't been, lots of great barbecue too. If you like food, um, so yeah. If there's any other questions. Um, let me know. Yeah, great music venues, definitely. Yep. And here's our website. Oops. There's also a cool racetrack in town. So I want to try and get there where I can go to a race at Circuit of the Americas and then come visit y'all the next day. Yeah, they were serving things. They were serving as a vaccine site for a while. Okay. So, um, but yeah, yeah, Circuit of the Americas is not too far away from us. And um, and while you're here visiting us, um, San Antonio Botanic Garden is not too far away. And they are very, they've done a lot of recent updates. Um, they have a new family garden and they have a new um, um, entryway and they're a beautiful garden as well. So they're like an hour and 15 minutes away. So I would go visit them. And then our another garden right here in Austin is the Zilker Botanic Garden. They're run by the city. Um, and they have a really nice garden too. So, um, so lots of great gardens to see um, just right here in, um, can you come without a membership? Yes, you can, Jean, you can come without a membership. Um, you just have to pay. We are a fee-based um, garden. So it's $12, I believe, uh, to get in. And because of COVID, we um, now have an entry system. So you have to reserve a time to come in. So you just go on our website, reserve a time, and you can, you can come on in. So yeah, definitely. Thank you for your time. And I hope you enjoyed learning about the Wildflower Center and, and Mrs. Johnson and the work that uh, she uh, started. And hopefully we're uh, carrying it out the way she wanted us to. So thank you very Great. much. Thank you very much for doing this. Um, definitely looks like a beautiful spot to come visit. Um, we're going to be real interested in seeing the results from your research on the burn. We've been experimenting with burning our meadow garden. We've burned it twice in the last three and a half years, I guess. So, and we're not 
totally sure we're seeing any differences, but it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that research. Yeah, I can share that with you. And Scott, I can put you in touch with our Burn Boss Matto okay. tool. All right, great. Yeah. And um, for everybody else that's still on, thanks for coming in. Um, our next tour is Wednesday, April 28th. It's going to be at 3.30 instead of 2 o'clock. Um, we'll have the director of the Lewis Ginter Botanical Garden in Richmond doing a tour, and he is a Hokie alumni, so we're going to keep it in the family on the 28th. So hopefully everybody can be here for that. Um, Tanya, thanks again. This was great. Um, hopefully we'll be able to see you in person sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.